We wouldn't be wanting to just be taking paper money that they know is going to depreciate. There would be a limit, and I think we're at that point. And when that happens, that will be a major event when when uh, the world rejects the dollar. So uh, when it comes and how it comes and how quickly it comes, those are still unknowns, but it will come, and I think we're starting it, uh, to see it happen right now. Absolutely. Congressman, uh, as a uh, doctor, as a congressperson, as someone who's been on the banking committees for many years and uh, studied Austrian economics, for those that don't know, uh, comparing our situation to the Weimar Republic, I see a lot of similarities. And we're already seeing inflation in commodities and, and inflation in food. Uh, what is the basic time frame that you see currently? And, and, and for those that don't know, what does dollar devaluation and the dollar losing world reserve currency status mean for people? Well, it means higher prices and eventually higher interest rates, which means higher prices again. Uh, but... Uh the government always reports statistics that are deceiving, and they they tell us that inflation is like one and a half, two percent. And yet, if you talk to the average person, they know that price is going up. And you're right about the commodities. There was a report yesterday. I think it was the S and P commodity index for last year. A, a whole group of commodities it was up at 24 uh, percent. That's huge, and uh, you can't have that and not have that translate into. Uh, you know, day-to-day -day living. And people know this, the energy prices are, are going to go up, and it wouldn't take much to push that oil up over $100. It's uh, bouncing around there already, and which means the standard of living goes down. You know, with if an individual borrows and uh, they get into debt, but they live high on the hog and they buy more cars than they need and have a fancy house, and their job is just marginal, but if they lose their job or prices go up, they get wiped out, and they have to, in order to get back on their feet again, they have to work harder and spend less. It's a little different with a country because they have this printing press, and they're able to tax people, but there is a limit. But the economic law is the same for the country as it is for the individual. The country eventually has to live beneath its means, and that's what we're witnessing now. And it usually hits some people more than others. So the middle class and the poor get hit the first. They lose their jobs, and they're hurt the most through the inflation. The very wealthy, actually, there's a transfer of wealth. Uh, this has been argued by Austrian uh, economists for, for decades that when you destroy a currency, it erodes the value of the currency, but the middle class suffer the most, and the wealth is accumulated uh, by the very rich. And, and we see we're that. Seeing. We're seeing that, and what does it do? It drives up resentment. You know, and if, we, if they don't fully understand this, the middle class who's getting wiped out, they only have anger, and they might strike out if everybody who has wealth rather than the wealth that has been accumulated because of the government programs. And the social engineers, as you know, uh, Dr. Paul, Congressman, uh, they're fully aware of that, the pressure from above and below. And so right when they got rid of the Glass-Steagall 11 years ago, we start seeing Rand Corporation reports. We start seeing Department of Defense reports saying we've got to basically set up a police state because there's a danger of social unrest coming uh, because of the dwindling middle class. And now we see a British Ministry of Defense report saying the same thing in 2007. And Lo and behold, now Homeland Security is putting in, in 9,000 locations, telescreens, saying watch your neighbors. Uh, with, three new videos were released yesterday, and frightening videos by Homeland Security airing on TV. They're up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com if listeners want to see it or if the congressman hasn't seen it. And it's got people in shopping malls and on the streets, and it shows DHS, TSA on the streets searching people, and it says we're going to protect you, but we need you to watch your neighbors. I, I mean, clearly they're trying to bring in an authoritarian system, not for al-Qaeda or these overseas reported threats, uh, but they're now shifting it over to domestic groups. And we saw that attempt to attack conservatives and libertarians and yourself and myself and even Sarah Palin and Rush Limbaugh and talk radio and the First Amendment after the tragic shooting. So uh, uh, can you speak to uh, that, sir, and this, and, and, and this conscious movement towards authoritarianism? Well, there, there's no doubt about it, and uh, you're absolutely right about uh, the uh, disruption that that comes to the communities because uh, it, it is there. Most major changes occur, you know, domestically. You know, we take an oath of office to obey the Constitution and defend it against enemies, uh, foreign and domestic. Well, 
you know, I usually make that point, and even in the very, very patriotic uh, crowds and veterans, which you think would be more hawkish, if you emphasize, you know, the domestic threat, they understand this. So, uh, but I think I think we're actually winning this argument about this need for militarism around the world to protect uh, ourselves, and that we have to worry about domestically because people are getting tired of having somebody from the government check every single single thing. You know, back again to China, uh, you can start businesses easier in China than here. So uh, people who have land, uh, people who want to start a business, uh, people who have to pay these high taxes and and uh, pay for all these regulations, they're, they're starting to realize this. So uh, I, I, uh, I think there's a healthy uh, resistance developing. But like you point out, there there is some danger here, and that is, of course, if we get people to understand where the cause comes from, that we might be able to uh, prevent this. See, the one thing, the one coalition that we should build, uh, we talk a lot about the the poor getting poorer and the middle class being wiped out, but the left uh, always thinks, well, the answer to that is just more transfer of wealth. But we have to get them to understand that the reason this happens is because government is too big, even though they argue for government programs. Uh, the government is too big. They argue for these programs, and guess who lost their homes? The rich got richer, and the poor people lost their homes because of this program. But the, big, the, big, uh, the other big issue is to make sure that people know that, uh, you know, uh, corporatism is not free market economics. And, and that's a misunderstanding. Well, that was my, my other point, and I'm glad you got into that uh, because we're of the same mind because we've studied history. But, but quantify that for, for listeners who may be new. The ultra robber baron, non-free market crony capitalist always, as Carol Quigley said at Georgetown, Bill Clinton's mentor, lobby for authoritarianism, whether it's right wing, left wing, fascist, socialist, communist, because they create this big pool of collectivized wealth and they take it offshore. And now the ultra-rich are trying to sell the poor people who are losing their jobs on higher taxes and looting their neighbor who's got more money than them, uh, selling them the lie that that's going to give them a good economy when it's freedom that's going to give them a future. Yeah, and then they lump everybody together. If you are a businessman, and there are a lot of very decent, wealthy businessmen in this country that earned it and didn't have to live off the government, but they get lumped into that. So when there's unrest... Uh, the the uh, everybody's lumped together. Whether they're the they're the people who uh, lived off the government, lived off the taxpayer, or whether they were successful because they delivered good products to consumers at good prices. Uh, so there's a big difference there. And you know, I've had some discussion with Ralph Nader, and I'm, I imagine there are a few of your listeners that can't stand Ralph Nader, but I like to talk to him because we do come up with some agreements on this. I mean, he hates this corporatism and uh, he doesn't like the war and things. So I work with people who can uh, agree with me on some of this. So this is what we have to do is, is uh, make sure our definitions are clear. Then we have a better chance at solving these problems. Very well said. Uh, Congressman, uh, we're seeing riots all over the world over global inflation driven by the devaluation of the dollar and other fiat currencies. You've, you've been mentioning unrest uh, here, and uh, clearly we're seeing more and more signs of that here. And uh, I remember you back in, 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 in Austin giving a speech that, uh, that I uh, attended seven years ago. We were talking about it during the break when you first got on, and you warned that when the empire starts collapsing, there's two ways to go. It's either recognize that big government breeds corruption and go the opposite direction towards liberty, but that more often than not, instead, the government's going to sell even more of the same uh, as the solution. And so now is the time to, 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 to get this out to people. I mean, this is a life and death situation for our republic, is it not? Yes, and, and it's hard teaching people uh, some of these lessons in the midst of a crisis. Uh, because then, uh, and you can understand the emotions, you know, when law and order breaks down, uh, most people say, well, this just Quit the killing. Calm down things. You better bring more police in. And that's, you know, a pretty natural response, but not realizing that uh, we have had too many policemen already and too many bureaucrats and too
too much federal government, too much taxes and all that. So it, it is to me, the earlier the education occurs, the better I think people have to know and understand why it's in their best interest, uh, that, uh, that, that, that the free market works better. People think that you have to sacrifice and all this. I don't think you have to sacrifice a thing, a freedom. freedom. If you get your freedom, you don't have to sacrifice anything because uh, you, you have your incentives. You can take care of yourself a lot better than the government, and, uh, and that, that's a system that has worked. And unfortunately, we're about to give it up, and that's why I fear the day when uh, law and order mm -hmm. breaks down. But people are questioning whether there will be riots in our streets like there have been uh, overseas already. And I suspect that the American people are like other people. And even in the 60s, we had our riots and our shares of, uh, of, of problems here. So people will uh, act in a violent manner. And uh, that's, uh, yes, sir. that's up for grabs. And, you know, all factions then will be looking to get the powers and the strings of, of government. So uh, we, we have a big job ahead of us. So we're going into some very stormy waters? No doubt. It's coming. It's Congressman, uh, no doubt you've probably heard about it or seen it, but CNN, MSNBC, Democracy Now!, they all singled you and I out specifically and played clips of you speaking uh, in your Texas Straight Talk and, and clips of my radio slash TV show where we talked about the Second Amendment being there, uh, and it's in the Declaration of Independence, it's in the Bill of Rights, to defend against crime on the streets, but also against a tyrannical government. Uh, and uh, they have tried to now demonize and imply that you and I and others uh, are the progenitors uh, in an asinine way uh, of what happened uh, in Tucson, which we now know was a schizophrenic who was politically a liberal. I'm not blaming the Democrats. Uh, but what do you think about the desperation? We saw Rachel uh, Maddow uh, and others uh, go after your son and tell a laundry list of Dr. Rand Paul, uh, and of course that backfired on him, only seemed to boost his approval rating when Clinton went and campaigned against him. Now we see them doing it against you and I because they see us as a threat because we're getting the truth out. Uh, what is your view on, A, the, 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 the ratcheting up of their rhetoric, Congressman Steve Cohen calling Republicans Nazis a few days ago, uh, and the fact that it's backfiring uh, in every case from the polls we're seeing? Well, there's a limit, and uh, that says something for the American people. Maybe they won't buy into that, but uh, they, they're they certainly going to make any effort. And this is a frustration for me because I do make a diligent effort to try to work with uh, honest, uh, straightforward people who may be called progressives and liberals because some of them are decent and they're honest, but they're not these demagogues. And those people who turn on you, their, their goal is more like the promotion of the Democrat Party or com promoting of, liber of, uh, uh, of government power. Uh, so they, they might say they agree with us on a couple issues, but they, I sort them out. And some of them, the ones that you're talking about, are just the demagogues who may one, say one thing and say, oh, yeah, we don't like this, we don't like that. But uh, then, then they'll, they'll turn on you and they'll do anything to maintain their power or to discredit us uh, for what we're doing. Well, uh, and it's also uh, hypocritical. They're demonizing the First Amendment and talking about fairness doctrine for talk radio, FCC. Uh, jurisdiction over the internet. This is all being announced while uh, Matthews is calling white people crackers. Uh, Maddow is implying that we're causing violence. Uh, the congressman's calling Republicans Nazis. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's just incredible how they're trying to balkanize and turn the American people against each other. When you look at the polls, liberals, conservatives, libertarians, almost everybody's against the banker bailouts, the wars. I mean, the, the momentum is, sh is shifting towards freedom. No doubt about that. Uh, but there's still a lot of people. In, I think that you can say at the grassroots level that is the case. Our problem has been, you know, it's taken a long time to build the bureaucracy. And when you think of these millions of people who are uh, living off the government and work for the government, and they work in Washington, they're embedded into the political system. And, and uh, so many in Congress, they have all clung to these, uh, these, these views that they've held before. But the American people, uh, you know, are further ahead. I think the people are always ahead of, of the politicians. And... Uh, Hopefully we'll win out on this fight, but unfortunately uh, uh, the opposition has a lot of guns. Isn't it interesting how they want to take our guns away, but everything that 
government does is depends on a gun. It's all about. You know, I mean, it's their guns against against the, the guns of the civilians. But but you know whether it's tax collection or telling you whether you can dig a ditch on your land uh, and how you can use your your land, you may uh, you know be um, you are accosted by a federal agent with with a gun. Everything they do has to be you know enforced with a with a gun, and it, it's it's a threat. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they never talk about that kind of gun violence. And how, you, how often have they been barging into houses, into the wrong houses, with guns blaring and blowing up the places and looking for drugs that didn't exist and not even apologize and uh, never compensate these people and sometimes hurt and kill some of these people, innocent people. And uh, that's the kind of gun violence that ought to be... Uh, uh, you know, rejected. Absolutely. Mao Zedong said political power goes out of the barrel of a gun. Well, we're the people, and that's our check and balance. Congressman, in the eight minutes we've got left with you, we have a uh, prisonplanet.com, infowars.com headline. Congressman, senator, or president, as you know, a lot of big scientific polls, the Hill newspaper, uh, uh, the uh, Democratic affiliate, uh, public policy polling, and others are finding that you're in the number one or number two seat to win the Texas Senate race. Uh, for U.S. Senate, if you so choose, um, and at the same time, you've won the CPAC coveted Republican straw poll while giving an anti-war, anti-empire speech. Uh, I have to just give you my opinion. I believe, as running for president, you don't have as good a shot as winning, though you do have, I think, a pretty good shot, but you'll have a much more powerful educational platform, I'd say 10 times bigger than 2008, going into the critical crisis, but if you go for a Senate, uh, you probably got a better chance of uh, winning uh, Congressman, and, and of course then you'd have even more power with the filibuster uh, in the Senate. Uh, Congressman Ron Paul, uh, that's you know the question A, what are you looking at there? And B, uh, you've said the people, if they're behind you, and if things continue to deteriorate right this, uh, you know, that folks will listen to you more, that you may run. I believe you're going to run because you know it's the right thing to do, and we win just by you running, being able to educate people. Where do you stand on this? Uh, people are chomping at the bit to know. Uh, and uh, I saw your quotes in the news saying that you are interested uh, in the Senate uh, polls you've been seeing. Well, unfortunately, uh, I'm still very ambivalent about all this. I usually am not ambivalent on my views and what I do and what my plans are, but uh, it, it, it does require a major decision, a personal decision, a family decision, a political decision, all of these things. So I am. I'm uh, I'm pretty undecided on what to do, and I think it through. People keep asking me, do you think about doing this or that? And I, I admit it, I do. I think about it all the time, not only because I wonder what I'm going to do the rest of my life, but I often uh, think about it because uh, when I get on radio talk shows, they ask me these kind of questions. But uh, I, I'm still pretty undecided on what I should do and what I can do and what I'll end up doing. Well, I challenged your uh, doctor and now senator's son when he was really just uh, exploring it more than, you know, I guess a year and a half, two years ago. And I said, look, Rand, you're going to win just by injecting real ideas. And I said, I believe you will win. And because, I mean, I'm no political uh, rocket scientist, but I could look at the field in Kentucky. I could see the Tea Party movement that, that, that your supporters uh, started uh, four years ago, three and a half years ago. And uh, look, he's there, he's won. He went through hell, but he's there, and he did the right thing for his country and for humanity. You, and just as I asked you on air and off air before you ran for president very early on, I know many others did, said, Congressman, I know it's rough on your family, the attacks, the physical danger, but I said, you've got to do it. And, and you're a man of, of, of conscience, uh, you know, a man who has a big heart and who I know uh, from your actions and your fruits, but also my discernment is the real deal. Uh, I don't think you have any choice but to run for president uh, and uh, or bare minimum Senate. And uh, it is your destiny, Congressman Ron Paul, and you're almost 40 years of standing up for liberty. And uh, so I'm drafting you right here, and I know my listeners are. And, you know, and if your health holds up, you've taken care of yourself. Uh, barring that, uh, I just hope and pray, sir, that you do run uh, for president. And I think the sooner you announce, the better, so we can get the money and the energy and the grassroots behind you. And I want you to know you've got my full support of our millions of listeners. Well, I, I appreciate uh, the, the comments. Uh, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just real, real difficult. The one thing I can assure you and all your listeners is that uh, it would be pretty hard for me to pack my bag and go and retire.
car and live quietly thereafter, hereafter, and not be involved. But no, regardless, I've been in and out of office. I've run for offices. I've won some, lose some, and all that. One thing is, it would be very hard for me to exist without working uh, diligently to promote our cause, and which is the cause of uh, personal liberty and and the things that I believe in, because I believe this is how people have an opportunity to, to improve themselves and uh, live freely and creatively. So I'm convinced of all that. So whether it's in political office or whatever, I will be working as hard as I can to promote that cause. Well, we know that. And, I mean, even if you just did the debates and didn't beat yourself to death flying everywhere, even if you did it electronically, which I think is the most effective, I think a lot of campaigning is outdated with the focus on the individual, you know, getting out there in person. Uh, I mean, even if you did it electronically, and, uh, you know, I mean, you've got to run, obviously, because of the educational uh, uh, points, but uh, obviously we respect your decision and we'll, and we'll appreciate you and support you regardless. But you can see, as Julius Caesar said, there is a t tide in the affairs of men when taken at the flood leads on to fortune. And the fortune we seek is the jewel of liberty, as Thomas Jefferson said, and that jewel must be guarded jealously. And you are the great guardian of that jewel. Of anyone in the world, you are that light standing out like no other. And uh, I don't think that you're going to uh, not run in my gut. I know you are. And, uh, Congressman, we just really, from the bottom of our hearts, want to thank you for the great work you're doing. We've only got about two or three minutes left. In closing, taking sights on auditing and then uh, reforming, abolishing the Fed. Uh, where do you uh, stand uh, with your Periscope sights uh, on that great uh, war mock? Well, well, I'm looking forward to that, and uh, I tried to get a hearing in January, uh, uh, but it, Congress is still disorganized because it's uh, newly created. So in February, the hearings are going to start. Uh, I did find uh, out also that the rules prevent me from insisting that Bernanke come before a, a, um, uh, you know, a, a subcommittee, and they, he only comes before a full committee. That's just the way the rules are, like a Secretary of Treasury, too. But it doesn't keep me from pursuing all the views that we have to have, exposing the Fed, transparency of the Fed, teaching people why the Fed is responsible for the booms and the busting, the unemployment and the inflation. I mean, it is a hot topic. It's going to get hotter, and we're going to have our side well represented. And the hearings are not going to be huge. Sometimes they have six and eight people come for hearings. Ours will be smaller, and they're going to be very deliberative, and there's going to be debate going on. I believe we're going to get a lot of attention. I think we can achieve a whole lot by, by this, and especially as we move into this crisis, because then once we expose the Fed, then we better start talking about a transition and how we get out of this. And already, you know, the, uh, the opposition, those at the World Bank talked about, yeah, we might have to have a new currency. Maybe we ought to use a little bit of gold. So they want to neutralize us a little bit, but they want to control everything. So this is going to be our challenge. What sure. are we going to place the system, replace sure. the system with? And that, that's uh, something I'll be working very hard on. Well, Congressman, as you know, we're here at the crisis. They're going to try to use it to get even more power. We've got to deal with it now. And there you are historically at the perfect time and perfect place. Have a great weekend coming up, Congressman Ron Paul, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want.